Okay, <clears throat> this is Cross Principles, and um, I thought we would um, look a little closer into Galatians 2.20. Uh, I don't know if we will really, really delve into the rest of Galatians. I, I certainly don't have any intention on teaching the book of Galatians, but... Um, Galatians, in, uh, though it's a fairly short book in three different places, talks about our crucifixion. And so I want to talk about the, cruci the believer's crucifixion, and I want to <clears throat> try to um, nail down what it is that Paul is trying to communicate. I think it's easy to memorize a scripture um, and then assume because we have it memorized, we know what, it, what it's really about. But uh, one of the things that affected me years ago was that um, I could see how the cross had genuinely impacted Paul and was yet impacting him. Okay, so it had been over for a while. Um, Paul had ministered for, I don't know, in his 60s, and um, the cross was still impacting it wasn't still just a truth it wasn't still something that he pointed back to when he said i am crucified with christ it's something that he's talking about the life that i now le now live in the flesh and the and the reality of how that is at work in him so i actually wanted to start in john chapter 10 first we'll just look at one short verse and then we'll go back well, we'll look at a few other verses before we get to Galatians. <clears throat> John chapter 10 and verse 10. Um, and here Jesus is talking, and um, he says, The thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. <clears throat> so there's a contrast going here. And the contrast with the uh, one side is uh, that they have come to destroy. All right, so remember, we're going to be thinking about Galatians 2.20 and begins with, I am crucified with Christ. Um, but Paul doesn't see that as destroying. He sees it in a, in a different way. Yes, there is a death. But rather, if he, if he followed through on what Jesus said here, he sees it as a way to obtain life, but not any life, not their life, not their, you know. But the, what people term as the abundant life or what Jesus says and, and uh, come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So, you know, um, Jesus, basically you could pick this scripture out and say Jesus came to give us life, okay? Jesus came to give us life. But the question is what is our definition? What's our definition of Jesus giving us life. Um, and, you know, the, the truth is, guys, we always, we have to measure everything that we hear, whether it's me or the, the uh, from some other church or some preacher on the, on the television or something, podcast. <laughs> you have to... Um, you have to weigh that in light of not just the scriptures, but seeking the heart of what the scriptures are trying to communicate, which would be what? Not the heart of truth, but the heart of the Lord. I mean, if you want to just get, it, get right down to it, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And, um, and he made that not a thing whereby 
you can get truth and you can figure out the way and you can have more life, <clears throat> but rather I am that, which interestingly enough, Paul begins Galatians 2.20 with I am crucified. Jesus begins it with, I am the way, the truth, and the life, or I am uh, the bread of life, or I am the living waters, or I am all of it. All of it beckoning us to move from our heads to our hearts and to find him, not to be settled to say, I have, uh, I've had an explanation of Jesus as the way, or the truth, or the life. And I am content with that <clears throat> um, because that contentment, if we, if we actually do that, that contentment um, causes us to uh, settle in in our religious thought patterns instead of finishing out what Jesus is saying. He says, no man comes to the Father except by me. And, okay, so what do we get out of that? See, that's the deal. We really, we really are very religious minded. He's not saying no man can get to heaven. He's not saying no man can be saved. He's not saying, he's talking about getting to the Father and the Father and, the, and, and doing that by Christ's relationship, doing that by Christ as our life, um, which Galatians 2.20 clearly declares that. Um, so I just see I just see in our ways of perceiving that we very quickly void out the very heart of the Lord and we're, we're more ready to accept the, the um, it's, see it's not even the teaching of what he said there or what he says here. It is to receive man's explanation of that when nobody can explain that to you except the one who said it. And you say, well, yeah, but he's dead and gone. No, he lives inside of you if you're born again, by the way. <laughs> you know, so, um, so every, every scripture, every teaching that me or Kelly or anybody else does around here or the, the, on Sunday mornings, all those that, that share, every teaching has to be um, challenged in a good way. Um, when I say in a good way, I'm just saying, you know, it's not a bunch of rebellion against every, anything that anyone says. We're not talking about that. We're saying, okay, you said that. It, it seems right to me, but, and here's where the challenge comes, but, you know, Holy Spirit or Father or Jesus, you know, I want to go beyond just hearing that and feeling good about it. I want it to become part of who I am by Christ. And then that, that's the life, you know, that's the abundant life. Then it's spreading beyond um, teaching, it's spreading beyond, you know, uh, shall I say truth with a small T, to truth with a capital T, which is him, I am, I am. I am. Uh, <clears throat> and then we realize that the way is not a prescribed, um, you know, so the Methodists have a method, right? <laughs> and the Baptists baptize you. And, uh, <clears throat> but we're no different here. It's no different here. You, you, you know, um, it still requires you not to settle into a way. It does, unless that way is him. And there are, we use terminology here, and a lot of people uh, come and they learn the terminology real quick, or maybe over time. Um, and that's good. You know, it'd be good to sort of understand what you know, someone said, but, but the truth is not in terminology. It's not. The truth is in Jesus and in fact is Jesus. And so um, it keeps you, it keeps you open, it keeps you humble, it keeps you hungry, it keeps you 
related to the Lord in a, a you know, Lord way. <laughs> Not Jesus is Lord, but but I'm under you in a certain spirit. You don't, you don't have to, you'd be better off not slapping the word Lord on that and just be under him in a certain spirit. You see what I'm saying? But we say, well, Jesus is Lord. See, we, that's, it just becomes terminology to us. And so that's what we say, and that's what I'm going to say, and, and I'm going to live that way, and <clears throat> am I going to walk uh, daily in some sort of a, a heart that says, I really don't know all of this, you know. But see, the, the goal for most, and particularly in Bible school, it's real easy to make the goal to, <clears throat> to um, learn a whole lot of good stuff. But learning a whole lot of good stuff is not going to do you any good. It is actually possible to go three years in this Bible school, and when you graduate, you really have almost no foundation, much less climbing up. Do y'all believe that? That's because y'all are the ones I'm talking about, not really. <laughs> but it just is. And, and the flow of the water that flows here is the same clear water. It's not, you know, it didn't just get clearer. You see what I'm trying to say? That it didn't just get clearer we, if, if we're getting it, if it seems more clear now, it's because we're in a better place and that better place better be <laughs> that we're more under and we're more hungry and we're more, what does that mean? I, you know, I mean, if, if we could, it would be great if we could just listen to sermons and sharings and teachings and Bible school and all this. If we could just listen to that and go, okay, I've heard this before. But why has this not had any effect on my life or very little effect on my life? To just really challenge yourself, you know? Who are we, you know, so many people are waiting for God. Well, if I'm off, God will rebuke me. You know, that's the way they look at it. Well, if I'm off, God's going to rebuke me. He's going to inter divinely intervene and shape me up. <clears throat> okay, well, look at the prodigal son. He's leaving home, and he says, give me the portion of goods. And You're not supposed to get it until the father's dead, first of all. Why are you asking for it now? Because you want it now in your timing, and you want to circumvent death and get all the benefits. Right? And that could be called Christianity or, or the, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> now, so the father, he... Gives him a portion of goods. <coughs> He's giving him his goods. It's the father's goods. The father has these things. And the, and the son takes off with them and probably assumes that they're magic goods because they come from the father. They come from God. Not magic, but you, you, know, you know what I mean. That there's something, something innately going to make everything go right after the prodigal leaves the home. That's kind of where I'm trying to, to go with that. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and so, <coughs> and so the father gives it to him and the son leaves. The father doesn't go, man, this is bad news. You shouldn't do this. Um, because the problem isn't the decision. The problem is what's working in him that made the decision. All right, so we see that the real problem is us. <laughs> the real problem really is us. <clears throat> and, um, you know, for Israel, it was, a, it was actually a 10-day journey from Egypt to the Promised Land. Wasn't it 10? 11 days? 11. Um, and they took 40 years. Well, why did it take 40 years? Why is it going to take you 40 years? I'm just kidding. But I mean, why? Why would that happen? It would happen because they never grasped the real truth of reality in, that's in Christ, that's in this person, that this person is what the Father wants out of us, that this person is the one that he wants our hearts in tune with, as well as the Father's heart toward that person called the Son. Um, and uh, so 
you know, it's, it's, in many cases, it's not just us, but it's us receiving, which is us, but it's us receiving a religious uh, way of proceeding instead of, like David, God said, God, David is a man after my own heart. David, what are you after? God's heart. I mean, does that explain it? Why, you know? Does that explain so much about David? Does that explain even when he messed up, you know, horribly messed up? And he says, and his prayer in what is it, Isaiah, I mean, um, Psalm 51, is that what it is? His prayer is, against you, against you only have I sinned. Okay, we say, well, yeah, no, we sin against God. No, he's not. He's sinning against the heart of that one because he's a man after his heart. It's not breaking laws and doing this wrong. It's, I have, you know, I have sinned against your heart. And David was broken. He wept. He was, you know. So how do you... How do you really say that, honestly? How do you say that? How do you, how do you communicate that? How do you impart that reality that it has to be on a certain level, a certain tenor that is not religious, that is not <clears throat> just trying to gain religious knowledge or just trying to, but trying to find the Lord with all its heart, a heart after God. Find the Lord with all its heart, soul, and strength. And do that at whatever cost. Somebody says, um, well, so-and-so uh, has never been placed in any sort of leadership place in this church because all they do is search the scriptures. You know, somebody could say that about somebody if, you know, if our classes were bigger. They, I've heard it before. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> all you do, is that all you do is search the scriptures? And, you know, the answer would be, um, you know, you're familiar with the scripture that uh, David says, search me, O God. Okay. I think that, I think that there has to be an openness. But it also, you wouldn't say search me, O God, in a right way if you weren't searching after him. Can you see that? You wouldn't. There's no way. You, you can say the words. You can, you know, want that. But desire is not enough without motive, without, uh, uh, without something that, that is pressing you. Paul said, I press toward the mark of the prize and the high calling in Christ. It's in him. What's in him? We say, well, it's the truth in Christ. No, it's what's in him. I want what's in you to be in me. And I want... I want to be one with that, and I want that to be my reality, and I want that to be my pursuit. And, um, <clears throat> but, you know, they, they could have said that of David. You know, they could have just looked at David and said, man, he's got the right job. Sitting out there, you know, the other seven brothers, he's got the right job. Just sitting out there in the field watching the sheep and getting to search the scriptures all day long. You know, sarcastically say that. Thinking, well, we're the, we're the older brothers. We're more mature. We know there's more to life. David, the Lord is my shepherd. I don't lack. You don't lack what? The Lord's shepherding. <laughs> I shall not lack. I shall not want. That's what the word want means, lack. He makes me lie down in green. I don't just flop down and go, I can't go on. <laughs> he makes me lie down in green. He leads me beside the still waters. And all of that, being with him in that way and, and finding him as the shepherd of what is, has it described in Peter? The shepherd of our souls. Somebody needs to shepherd our souls because our souls are out of controls. <laughs> you know, do you remember the first class and I wrote what's the problem and we wrote yeah. sins and sin and all that stuff and we found out that the soul actually is the thing that causes, causes the first sin or the, 
What's the name for the? I forget it. What? The great transgression. Yeah. The. Um, I can't remember what it is. But I know that it was the first one that caused the fall of everything else. And there, that soul, if it's not shepherded, you know, what's going to happen to David after they come and they anoint him as king? He's going to start going, you know, I need to be king. Saul, you're not king anymore. God rejected you. I'm king. He knows who to appoint as king. He knows who needs to be responsible. You people can't do the job. <laughs> I can do the job. I don't think highly of myself. I, it, it's not, I'm not bragging. This is just fact. <clears throat> All right. Unshepherded soul. Because the shepherd is also, if you read more in John 10 where we just left, I'm the good shepherd because I pet the sheep. No. I'm the good shepherd because I feed them on a regular basis and it gives them security that life is always on. I'm the good shepherd because I lay down my life. All right. So the shepherd's actually a sheep or a lamb. Our shepherd is a lamb. John the Baptist saw Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. <clears throat> so, where is he going to shepherd us when David sees that? Where is he? He's going to shepherd him to the altar. He's going to prepare him for the altar so that when the day comes that he's going through the valley of the shadow of what? Death. Death. What do you think that is? It's the altar. You don't fear any evil because the, the lamb is not just with you. He's in you. Right. All right. So <clears throat> you take David's life from then on, from, from, from the Lord is my shepherd to uh, the things that happened after that. He's, he's just with the Lord. And when the time came, Saul was trying to kill him. The, the crowds were already singing Saul has killed his thousands and David is ten thousands. He already had more people with him than Saul did. So this is the time to make it all correct and right. Get those people united to stand up for David so that I can become king now. No, David didn't utilize that. He didn't fall to that. He didn't fall in that that trap. He didn't, he, he, he didn't, not because he was a greater man, but he sought the heart of the Lord and he saw the heart of the Lord wasn't to do that. And so he ran and he looked like the dark night. <laughs> he looked like he was the evil one. He looked like he was what was wrong. He looked like he was a rebel. And remember Nabal? Nabal said, who is David but a rebel who's, who's rebelled against the king? David knows that God anointed him as king, but he's not telling anybody and he's not standing up for it. He didn't go to Nabal and say, dude, you are wrong. You weren't there. You know, or, you know, Nabal, you don't even know me. You ever heard that line before? <laughs> you don't have to use any of that stuff. You don't have to use any of it. You don't have to go there. You don't have to. You just have to have a heart that's going after God. And David is, in the Old Testament, one of the biggest pictures of what that means. And I, I personally think Paul's the New Testament picture of what that means. Because for, for Paul, he, he understands. He understands what it means, John 10.10, 10, Jesus gave us life. Jesus gave me life. Um, Let's look in Acts chapter 9. 
And the reason why I'm turning there is because <clears throat> I want you to see sort of uh, the path of David. I want you to see um, what he goes through um, and how it ends up being handled ultimately. So we'll just start with the worst. And of course, uh, remember, we're, we're sort of trying to give a definition of Jesus said, I've come to give you life, okay, John 10, 10. So we're, so we're going to follow his path to the definition that God has of what it means that I've come to give you life. <clears throat> Acts 9, verse 1, and we'll read down a ways. And Saul, so this is Paul. This was his name before he converted. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter. Okay. Do we really have to, you know? All right, so Jesus on the throne is what? He's a slaughtered lamb. That's the actual Greek word there that says he's a lamb slain. The word slain, the word slain is really slaughtered. It's not, it's not just that Jesus was slain on a cross. He was like a lamb that was slaughtered. He's a slaughtered lamb. See, he's not a slain person. He's a slaughtered lamb. <clears throat> and <clears throat> but Paul here is breathing out. I mean, that, uh, that word, breathing out, this is the junk that's on the inside of him. Why can't you just keep that in? Because I'll get all bottled up and then I'll <laughs> whatever, you know. Breathing out threatenings and slaughter. Okay, so... You know, if I was there, I would say, Saul, just threaten me, okay? Don't slaughter me. <laughs> you know? But this is what's in him. <clears throat> against. See the next word there? Against. He's, bring, he's breathing these out against. At this point, it's not even important that they're the disciples of the Lord. What's important is he doesn't agree with this. He will later come to agree with the disciples of the Lord and become one, but right now, the only issue isn't they're wrong and I'm right. The issue is he doesn't agree with them and he sees them as wrong. Can you believe that you can actually see someone as wrong when they're right and see someone as right when they're wrong? Okay, good. Against, and the, the point I was making is it's just against. It's not it's not. For it's a, I'm against that and I'm against this and I'm against that and it's it's it has no no fixed gaze into the heart of the Lord. It has a fixed you know and if we look at the Book of Revelation, what he appears at the end or certainly in the beginning, if we look there, we see that the fixed gaze would be on a slaughtered lamb who gave himself for others in death to his own loss all right so there's no fixed gaze on that there's slaughter there but he bore it in paul there's slaughter here but he wants to do it so there's the crucified and the crucifiers and you know it's really things kind of boil down to that ultimately how about this one? Do you believe that you can think yourself to be one of the crucified and not a crucifier and yet crucify people all the time? <laughs> well, it's possible. I kind of addressed that in uh, the last blog on the story of uh, wolves and lambs where it, I just went through a bunch of the scriptures showing that, showing that contrast of what wolves are like and what lambs are like and what wolves do to uh, lambs. And however, they're not just wolves. They will eventually get smart and they'll put on lambs clothing. They'll look like sheep. They'll look like lambs. And Jesus said, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Okay. So, you know, we, we put on the lamb, 
we do that so that we look a certain way. And we, you know, someone might come up and say, gosh, you know, you, that is the best looking lamb outfit I've seen. You've trimmed it perfectly around your teeth where you don't see them. And, you know, you just, uh, you got all of these, good, you've groomed this lambskin so well. It just looks really good. Um, you know, but inwardly, they're still what they are. And it doesn't even say, but inwardly, they show what's inward, outwardly. They do, of course they do. But Jesus is not putting his finger on the outward manifestation. He's saying, inwardly, this is what you are, and you do it. You, you, you wolf. Your mindset is wolf. Your, your, uh, your ways of dealing with things you don't like is wolf. You, um, maybe you never bite anybody. That's hard to believe because, you know, wolves will be wolves. <laughs> but maybe you don't. Maybe you don't. And we think we're well covered because I have this lambskin on, but God says, Jesus says, inwardly, I know what you are. You, you're this. You're not, you're not me. See, it's not saying you're not saved. I'm not even trying to make a point of that. I'm just saying, what is the difference between staying fixed on Jesus and um, not doing that and not letting your heart run after him, run after the Lord, not letting your heart do that, but just biding your time and just going long and, you know, well, I'm gaining ground. I know I am because time's passing <laughs> you know, instead of, instead of, you know, really gaining ground. Um, and if we don't, if we don't do that, then, you know, I mean, I don't know how many graduation certificates I've passed out over the years, but it's a fair amount when you consider how small we are just as a church and a Bible school. But I really don't get a lot of joy out of that. Well, the president's going to, you know, present you with this piece of paper with ink on it. No, let's come and let's get the Lord and let's know the Lord. And, and who cares about, you know, the certificate or this or that, all that paper will one day fade and turn to dust. But what is the Lord is eternal and will never change and will always be with you and will be with you through a thousand things that would, that would have been completely different if you hadn't had the Lord in this manner. So, you know, and you could also say, and the Father is my shepherd, in the sense that the Lord is the lamb in you. And he's going to lead you beside still waters. He's going to take you where you need to go all your life. He, he will, he, you know, we always go, well, what's my ministry going to be? <laughs> Ministering to Jesus, you know, knowing him and thrilling his heart that that's what you want and desire and where you live that he, he he sees that this isn't three wise men showing up once give him some gifts and gone and that's fine i mean it's it's great but it's not what he wants you understand what i mean you know i can hear somebody saying you're talking bad about iranians because they came from Iran. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm, I'm just saying that we can do that. We can make our Christianity uh, once a week and maybe out of four weekends, four Sundays in a month, maybe once or twice actually give him the gifts that he wants, but not have that heart that just what's, I just want to give you what you want all the time. And you do that to the Father. I just want to give you your son all the time because that's what you want. Or I can say, no, what I want is I want to 
do this or that and then leave that. Okay, does that, does that make, make a person unsaved? No, it doesn't. You're saved by grace, not works. Amen? Don't forget that. So we're not, not, in none of this am I talking about salvation. So if a person said, well, I just want to be saved. Well, okay, <laughs> you know, uh, that's fine. Good. That's a great thing for eternity. But that's not going to change my heart. I want the Lord now. I want him every second that I can have him. All right, I'm not getting very far in the scripture, am I? <clears throat> uh, I didn't even finish the first verse. Okay. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues. Uh, so he's going, and he's going to the top person um, to get permission to do what is the exact opposite of Jesus. He's, going, he's got permission to slaughter the lambs. Right? Is it possible to have, you know, someone higher up give you permission or preach in such a manner that it gives you permission to, um, to violate the very nature of Christ? You know? Well, I'm not putting that down. I'm not even talking about them. I'm talking about us. If we're looking for permission, we'll find it. Somebody will give you permission. Um, verse 2, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, <laughs> this way, what way, this lamb way, this I am the way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth. And he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And I've shared on that recently. And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick, kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord. He, trembling and astonished, said, Lord. Okay, first I want to know who you are. He said, Jesus, he didn't say, I am the Lord of the universe. I am almighty God. He didn't use any of that stuff. Jesus didn't use any of that stuff. I mean, don't, don't y'all find that a little strange? Because he's almighty God and everybody's after power, so show it off right off the bat, man. Get him, you know. I'm just Jesus. That's his earthly name. They named him that at his birth. I'm Jesus. I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Wouldn't it have been more powerful if he said, I'm God and you're persecuting me? Because we know that, God, that Jesus is God. He didn't at that time. And again, he could have used a different name or a different word in, uh, to prove he was God. He just doesn't lift himself up. He just doesn't. See, see this, that's just another example of constantly this spirit is going forth, and we don't see it because we just read the story and we go, yeah, what happened was Paul was going to go do some bad stuff to people, and then God showed up, you know, because in our mind, God showed up, and he went, oh, and he fell down and said, okay, I'll, I'll do whatever you want or something like that. But he said, I'm Jesus whom you persecute. I'm, I'm the one that you're wounding, not those people. I'm the one. And Paul called it, called that spirit Lord. He called it Lord because he saw something, he heard something. He was in the presence of something so completely the opposite of the way that he was on the inside. And it moved him. And it brought him down. And he was astonished at the reality of it. And he called him Lord. 
And he did that, you know, he did that at the beginning. Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, but he didn't say the Lord said, I'm Lord. Whom thou persecuted. And then verse 6, and he trembling, astonished, said, Lord, again, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. All right, so, you know, you know the rest of the story. But he, he's, he ends up being blind now. He's blind. And he is taken by the people that were going with him to persecute and to put into jail, whether men or women, they had to help him get to where he was going. They didn't, they didn't hear the voice. And he's blind. And all he can see and hear is I'm Jesus, the one you persecuted. That's Jesus. That's who that is. That's Jesus. And he's not saying my followers are being assaulted by you. He said. I mean, he, he said that's my body, yes, because that's his body. But he didn't say that's my body. He said you're persecuting me. And he's blind. And he's, he's taken to a place he doesn't know, to a person he doesn't know. And he's in that, that case for, for a while. And he's, he's affected not just by something eternal that happened, not just by a supernatural event. He's affected by the heart of the Lord. And that's where we miss it. We're not after the heart of the Lord. So we never we violate him all the time. And we don't know him. But if we do know him, if we know his heart, not know him. I know Jesus. You know, he's Lord of all and he's this and that. That's not the knowing that's going to get you where you want to go. It is when you're after his heart, you start that way. And David started that way. And, you know, and I'm using the example of of Paul sort of being like David in the New Testament, that his heart is that way. And then, just in contrast to that, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, starting with verse 29. And, and what we're, what we're going to see here is Paul, no longer Saul of Tarsus, we're going to see Paul, you know, Ephesians 4, starting with verse 29. And we're going to see what soaking in the presence of the Lord has done to a man. We're going to see drastic changes. We're going to see, um, we're going to see a man transition from Jesus is a, a, a deceiver and is worthy of death, and so are his followers. To Jesus' life, to this point here, where the life on the inside of him has transformed him. Transformed him in spirit, in actions, in in ways. So verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Okay, that's no big deal to us. We hear that. Okay, yes, yes. And do we take it as, as the heart of God? Do we take it as the heart of God in me is telling me I don't want corrupt communication coming out of my mouth and I want to do I want what comes out of me to be good for the use of building up others and I want it to minister grace do we don't do that we say okay yeah and we usually think that we're pretty much already doing that and I I'm just going to keep on doing the way I am I'm really good I'm 
not really a wolf in sheep's clothing, because I, when I look in the mirror, I see a sheep. <laughs> but Paul, but Paul, he's going, don't do it. Don't tear down others. Don't slaughter. Don't threaten. Don't. That's what he's saying. He's he knows the other. He's he was on the other side. You know, he he came from the dark side. <laughs> and now he's he is he's being transformed by the renewing of his mind. And and not only that, but but there I know there has to be a pathos. There there is a a a deep passion. Don't let this communications come out of your mouth. This corrupting, it'll just corrupt people. It'll have motives in it that'll turn them to you and turn them away from this person and, and try to control the situations that you get into. And don't do it. Don't let that corrupt communication come out of your mouth. And But, 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 let's, you know, he's saying, don't. Be like Saul of Tarsus. Don't be like that. It's horrible. It's horrible. You don't want to be like that. But let's be like Jesus. Let's, let's do that. Let's speak that which is going to literally build them up. And, and it's also going to just uh, uh, minister to them. It's going to minister grace. And if, if you know what grace is in Galatians 2, 20 and 21, you'll, we'll see that eventually. He's not talking about grace to be saved. Okay, um, they're already saved. He's talking to the church at Ephesus. So this grace he's referring to is not salvation grace here. Um, and grieve not the Holy Spirit. Oh my God, can you hear the, the, the heart that is towards the Lord and towards the Holy Spirit? And it is, it is a, a man like David who is caught up in the reality of this person that is God, and, and it's, I know this is going to sound weird, but it's almost like they don't have to be God. I'm just for them because to make him God makes me all twisted in this. How can I just say, I love you, Jesus. I want to serve you. I want to be with you. I, I, to me, you're the most wonderful person that's ever existed what a nature what a what a way to see things and holy spirit i don't want to grieve you see he's not saying oh we don't want to grieve the holy spirit <laughs> you know what i'm saying he's saying and don't grieve the holy spirit grieve not the holy spirit you know let's let's be in tune let's be in tune with them with the Trinity, with the Father, with the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and let's not, because you know, he says in Philippians, man, I was doing good in the, the Jewish religion. That's what he called it. The, I was good. I was one of the top ones, he says in Galatians too, in Philippians and Galatians. I was doing good in that religion. But I was grieving the Holy Spirit by my corrupt communication. I was, I was um, breathing out slaughter, and now let's, let's, I'll, I'm sorry, I'll just say it like this for now, let's be sheep for the slaughter. Jesus said, I'll send you forth as sheep for the slaughter, didn't he? Okay, so, and grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed unto. We, you, we usually focus in on, oh yeah, I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit into the day of redemption. To you know, um, how about grieve? I don't want to grieve you. Okay, how about this one? Most people wouldn't have a clue how to grieve or not grieve the Holy Spirit. It, they wouldn't even have a clue. They, it's like if I grieve him, you know, 50 times a day, I wouldn't know it. You know, okay, well, how are we going to learn that? Well, in class 17 of Micah, no, <laughs> no offense against that. I'm just saying, no, or 17 of, of cross principles, no, 
No, you got to go to that well and keep taking it out of his heart, you know? Dipping in your bucket and taking and drinking, the, drinking of his heart and of his views and of his ways and, and let, you know, when we see this let no communication and we realize that we have, we still do it and we just have never taken it as his heart and we, therefore we're grieving the Holy Spirit and that's never been an issue to us. When we see these things, we need to let it deeply affect us and say, I'm grieving you. I'm persecuting you. I'm, do you see the, there's a, there's a, there's a flow happening here. And to just go, I just can't do this anymore. I, I must have you, Jesus, in this way. Verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger. Okay, well, <laughs> we're all in trouble then, you know. But notice he says all. How do you get rid of all? Well, it has to be no more the old nature. And it has to be all Jesus. So you, you can't say, I just want your salvation. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can't say that or go, it won't be all. It'll just be that portion that he died for us. But it won't be him in fullness before the foundation of the world or afterwards that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Wow, you go, well, how am I ever going to attain to that? Well, it's easy. You already have it. You just need to grow up in him who is the head in all things. But that's, again, not a religious pursuit. Amen? All right, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor. See, some of you have clamor. <laughs> some of you have been clamoring. I'm going to leave that to the Holy Spirit. But you know you've been clamoring. <laughs> <clears throat> and evil speaking. Well, we would go, ooh, evil speaking, you know. Satan's my friend, you know. No, that's not, that's not what he's talking about. <laughs> he's, he's talking about speaking against others so that it would promote you. You would look better and putting them down. That's evil. That is just flat out evil, you know. But the, see, the reason why we do that is because we want to look better than that person, okay? Well, that's not the spirit of Christ, amen? I mean, he laid down his life, he got low, he, you know, he thought it not a thing to be held on to, to be equal with God, but became as a man, and da-da-da-da, and all that, it's, it's describing the spirit. Be, let all of that be put away from you with all malice, okay. For once, he gives you permission to use malice. That means full intent, fully aware of what you're doing. With malice, I'm doing this. I'm putting away all that junk that was my nature, my life, my how I got ahead, how I looked better, how I was became accepted, you know, what if you just got in so much deeply into his heart that the only acceptance you were really after was the Father's acceptance of the Son that's within you? I mean, think of that. That's This is my goal. This is my goal. Well, brother, if you do that, you're going to end up looking bad to a lot of people. You know, someone can say that to you. I'm trying to talk you out of it. You know, you're going to end up, this is not going to be good for you. you got a lot of potential. <laughs> you know, the great things are there for you. If you go this route, it's going to end all of the good stuff. Well, but it won't end all the God stuff. But it's still the heart of the Lord that you're after. You can't go wrong with that. There's an end to this other stuff. You know, you know what I'm saying? There's an end to that. There is no end to being with the Lord throughout all eternity in the way of his own heart. <clears throat> I'm I'm just trying to get through this scripture, okay? We're almost done here. <laughs> uh, and then finally, verse 32. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So, here you have it. You have a guy who's breathing out threatenings and slaughter, saying, look, we need to just be kind to one another. Paul, what happened to you? 
I got abundant life. <laughs> I got the I am kind of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I got the I am kind of life. Uh, tender hearted, tender hearted, tender hearted. Why didn't you just say soft spoken or no, no, it's a thing of the heart. It's a thing of the heart. And it's a thing of the tender heart. Well, I'm, I'm going by my heart now. No, no, you're just walking funny. You know what I mean? You're sticking your heart out further than your mind. You're, you know, the, the question is, are you tender hearted or are you wolf hearted? That's the question. That's the issue. <clears throat> Forgiving one another. Can you see Paul? If he was back during that time, and he's going, well, these guys are all rebelling against the Jews' religion, but, you know, I'm just going to forgive them all, you know. Somebody said, Paul, you need to start breathing out some threatening and slaughter. we got to put an end to this, you know. I'm just going to be with the Lord and his spirit. I'll trust him for the results of dealing with other people. Right now I need to deal with me. So... Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Okay, so God, for Christ's sake. God, God did this because Jesus wanted you forgiven, and Jesus wanted you tenderhearted, and Jesus wanted you that way. Reverse it. The, father, the Son does it for the Father because the Father is tenderhearted, and the Father wants you to forgive and wants you forgiven, and da-da-da-da. It's the same Spirit. It's one Spirit. God is one. They're three in one, but the one is this spirit. And that's what makes them who they are. <clears throat> so, I think those are pretty drastic changes. What do you think? And I'll just close with this. If you ask Paul, Paul, what, what happened to you? You know, what happened to you? He would say, I am... I'm living a different life than I used to. And we would say as Christians and religious people, I am too. I'm very Christian. I just get drunk all the time. Now I'm living a different life. So next, next week, <laughs> we'll move on from here and find Paul's true explanation of I am living a different life than I used to. Amen. Lord, bless your word and May the Spirit of God not be grieved, and Jesus, may you not be grieved by us persecuting what really is you. May we find your heart, and may you allow the Holy Spirit to, to find keys to those hard walls and doors, iron gates, to be able to get in and bring us to the place where it is no longer about our soul life living for you. It's about your life in us living unto the Father. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I do.